Good evening. So my name is Koshik De. I'm a professor of physics right here at UTA. Today, I would like to talk about uh, big data. And you know what? I don't have the clicker. Now, since they are uh, video streaming this, I wonder if I have to start again from, hello, good evening, I'm Dr. D <laughs> I'm Koshik De. All right, so what did I say? I was gonna talk about big data. And I will try to make that uh, both the story of big data and the path of big data and the future of big data. And along the way, along the journey, uh, we will talk about, uh, I would also like to talk a little bit about my personal uh, involvement with big data. So what is big data? If you uh, look at this curve, this is a curve of the cost of storing data over the last 35 years. Now, if you wanted to store uh, 32 gigabytes of music files, which you can do quite easily now on your smartphone. If you wanted to do that about 35 years ago in 1982, that would have cost you, if you look at the plot, $32 million. This plot is a logarithmic plot, which means that if you look on the scale on the left-hand side, you will see that it goes 1 million, 100,000, 10,000, because factors of 10. So the cost of storage over the last 35 years has been falling like a rock. It's gone down by a factor of two every couple of years. And this has been a trend which has made it possible for us to talk about big data. If we did not have this uh, trend in technology, we would not be standing here talking about big data. And by the way, you would not be sitting here looking on your iPhone or your Samsung or your uh, big data devices that now you can carry in your hand with you everywhere that you go. There is one other component to this revolution, which is actually probably more well known than the plot that I showed you about the cost of storage. This is the plot of computing power. This is often known as Moore's Law, which is named after Gordon Moore, who was the founder of Intel, who originally uh, came up with the uh, rough idea that maybe we can double the number of transistors that we put on a computer chip every couple of years. And what you see here is exactly the same trend. And what big data is about is not just that you can store enormous amounts of data, but that you can process enormous amounts of data. So just as the cost of storage has gone down over the last 35 years, the power of computing has gone up exponentially over the past uh, 25 years. So this is what has driven the explosion in big data worldwide. It has enabled things like scientists, uh, uh, it has enabled things al almost in every area of research, people are using big data. Whether you talk about physics, my own field, whether you talk about chemistry, biology, materials, economics, sociology, urban planning, in every field, big data has changed how people do their research. And it has changed our lives, it has changed our lives in every possible conceivable way, not just because of the smartphones, but because of uh, self-driving cars, because of the computing power that we have at our disposal. And what has happened is as this revolution has been taking place, scientists and engineers have built bigger and more complex devices that collect more and more data because it is, we can do it, because it is possible for us to do it. So uh, we have put sensors and instruments everywhere uh, to take advantage of uh, big data. And today, the buzzword, the buzzword is exascale. We are marching towards exascale. 
What does excess scale mean? That's that one followed by the 18 zeros. That's the number of bits or bytes of storage that we are capable of uh, handling. That's the number of uh, flops of computing power that we are capable of handling. And it's a lot of zeros in there. So let me give you for the next five minutes some examples of uh, research in physics, how that has changed with the advent of big data. This is research that I have been part of, as you already heard the secret, I've been here for 25 years. So I've been at UTA for exactly the period through which we saw this technological revolution. So I do my research. Uh, I started doing my research 25 years ago when I arrived at UTA. And don't ask me why. Uh, did I come to UT if I wanted to do my research in Geneva, Switzerland? But that's where uh, 25 years ago, uh, the European uh, countries along with US and Japan started to build the largest particle accelerator in the world. It is 100 meters underground. It is in a tunnel which is 27 kilometers round. And it is so long, the tunnel, that it didn't fit in one country. It actually goes through Switzerland and France. It is right next to Lake Geneva, and it is right next to the French Alps. So this particle accelerator, which is the most ambitious and the, uh, still the most powerful particle accelerator in the world, uh, was built, why? To study the most fundamental properties of nature, to study the most fundamental laws of physics. Over the last uh, 10 years, while this uh, accelerator has uh, operated, we have published over 700 papers from the data that comes out of this accelerator. And uh, four or five years ago, I actually stood on this stage and gave a, a TED talk about the discovery of the Higgs boson, which got the Nobel Prize in physics in 2013. That was made possible by our uh, experiment. And there are many, many more things that we can explore. But today, that's not what we want to talk about. What we want to talk about is really big data. And uh, to get the context for the big data, uh, you have to look at what we put in this accelerator. 100 meters underground, we built the largest scientific instrument ever built. And it's still the largest scientific instrument ever built. We started building it 25 years ago, and it is in uh, Geneva, Switzerland, and it is called Atlas Detector or Atlas Experiment. You can go look it up on the web. It's called atlas.ch, and you can learn more about it. For the purposes of big data, what you have to realize is that Atlas, you can think of Atlas as just as a camera. It's a very complex camera. It's a very large camera. It's not something that you carry around with you. Uh, it, it can take pictures few hundred million times a second. It's not like your ordinary camera where you can barely uh, press the button a couple of times a second. It, you can't even put it on uh, your normal camera in auto mode and get more than 10 pictures per second. This picture can take 100 million pictures every second. And each picture has tens of millions of bits of information in it. And that would never have been possible without big data. This is the experiment that we started building 25 years ago. Most people don't really know when they're in the middle of a revolution. We were in the middle of a technological revolution. We started building an experiment that would never have been possible without the technological revolution of big data. We started building an experiment uh, 25 years ago, and it turned out to be an extremely successful experiment, extremely successful project without uh, while we were in the middle of this enormous technological revolution that we all now benefit from in society. Now, one of the problems that we faced with all of this data coming from our experiments is that how do you uh, analyze it? I mean, it's a lot of data. So uh, we had to do something extremely innovative. There was no supercomputer. There were no Google or Amazon. There were no data centers that, were, that was capable of analyzing all the data that we're collecting from this experiment. So what did we do? We said, you know what? This is a big experiment. This is something that a lot of people are interested in. 
In fact, it turned out thousands and thousands of physicists from all over the world, from about hundreds of different universities and labs wanted to be part of this experiment. And at every single one of those universities and labs, just like at UT Arlington, there was a computing center. There was a computing center at every single one of them, and we uh, punched it into our little calculator, and we said, you know what? There is enough computing power in the world for us to be able to uh, do the analysis of the data and make the discoveries that we want to do, if we can make all these computers work together. So our next task, was to invent the software that allows you to do that. So 12 years ago, uh, I founded this uh, project, which is called the Panda Software, this Panda project. It was developed right here at UT Arlington and Brookhaven National Lab in New York. And we developed the software that allows hundreds and hundreds of computing centers all over the world to work together to solve and analyze the scientific data that we were collecting at CERN through ATLAS. This was the, really the cutting edge of US innovations. In fact, uh, three or four years ago when uh, President Obama uh, announced the big data initiative in the White House, in the pamphlet that was given out, uh, was, Panda was mentioned as an example of US inno innovation that has led the uh, technology uh, of big data. So uh, just uh, to give you another example over the last uh, uh, six, seven years or so, you can see how uh, the scale at which Panda operates has gone up by almost a factor of 10. It mirrors and reflects what we can do technologically through innovations that we develop in our labs. And in these Google Earth uh, pictures, what you see all the, uh, are all the data traveling between all the different universities and labs uh, that are analyzing that less data, including a supercomputer right here at UTA at uh, Chemistry and Physics Building, uh, walk by room uh, 115, and you'll be able to see the supercomputer uh, in that room, which is analyzing the data, uh, along with these hundreds of other places all over the world uh, to uh, extract the science from an Atlas experiment. So this is why I call this talk the road to big data. It is an extraordinary technological innovation that I've been uh, fortunate to be part of. I gave you an example of how, while this revolution was taking place, we were figuring out how to uh, take advantage of it and using it for science. Uh, this has changed every field of research, every field of science over the last 35 years. This is an extraordinary achievement of human innovation and ingenuity, what we have experienced uh, uh, during this last uh, uh, 35 years. It has touched, it now, today, touches every life, both in the uh, results from all the scientific endeavors, but it also touches every life in very everyday things like the amount of data that you have in your smartphone, the access to the uh, uh, intelligence, uh, artificial intelligence that you have in your smartphone. So I would like to end my talk with a question. What about the future? Where are we headed? Do we really expect uh, this to continue for the next 25 years? This is a question really more for you. What are you going to be doing for the next 25 years? I have taken part in this for the last 25 years here at UTA. So what are the challenges for you? Well, there are challenges. And you will have to be innovative in order to meet those challenges. If you look at Moore's law, and this is the same plot that I started my talk with, except it goes a few more years. So instead of stopping at 2010, it goes to 2015. What you see is that everything is flattening out. Things are not just going up and up and up like you saw uh, the 25 years before. Technology is slowing down. That's a challenge. But it's also an opportunity. It's an opportunity to innovate. Remember, when we were trying to analyze the data from our experiment, we couldn't find a computer that could do it. So what did we do? We figured out that if we took all the computers in the world at all the institutes that participated in an experiment, we can make it work. That's the kind of innovation, that's the kind of thinking that you need to do 
in order to make the next 25 years have the same kind of technological revolution that we have seen over the past 25 years. Now, there are signs. There are signs of worry along the way. The National Science Board published its uh, report, which it does every couple of years, on the state of science and engineering. And one of the metrics that they look at is the number of publications in science and engineering by country. And what do you see in this plot? In red is the European Union. It's starting to go down. In blue is the United States. It's starting to go down over the last few years. In brown, right below it, going up and up and up, just like we used to do 25 years ago, this is over the last uh, 10 years or so, is China. Below that is Japan, which is flat. Below that is India. So we are losing some of our edge in innovation. This technological revolution of big data uh, took place in the US, in Japan, and mostly in, the, uh, in Western Europe. It is wonderful to see all the countries like China and India now investing, making investments in areas that can get us uh, to the next revolution, but we need to do the same. So that's what I ask of you, is that you go out there and make sure that we continue down this path that we continue down this journey with one more final plot, also from the National Science Board, which shows the number of doctorate degrees that are awarded per country. And you can see the same thing. It's slowing down in the US. It's slowing down in Europe. And this is what we have to reverse. And I think it is all within your power to do this. I think this is all within your uh, uh, ability to do this, and this is what is my challenge for you for the next 25 years. Thank you.